Okay, Renee, did you have something you wanted to say? Perfect. Sorry, just unmuted. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. We have our friend Edie Ekman with us today to learn how to make this chevron crochet tank top using Karen cotton cakes. My name is Renee L from Your Inspirations, and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. Please feel free to drop your questions in the chat, and we'll make sure that Edie answers them. While we're getting ready to kick things off, let us know where you're watching from. Over to you, Edie. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm going to hold up this uh, tank top that we have here, and I can't get the whole thing in the screen. Obviously, I can't wear it because this is a small, but just want you to see what it looks like in real life. And then I'm going to talk you through how it's made. I'm going to give you kind of the overview first, and then we'll get into the actual crocheting of it. So let me switch my camera view here so you can see what's going on. So here we have a close up of it. And it's two pieces that are alike. And what we'll be doing is basically doing a foundation chain here and increasing at the center. And as we increase at the center, it's going to grow out and create this bodice shape. So you'll have these, you know, two pointy bits here. Then go into a straight part where it's not increasing anymore and it's just going to increase here and decrease at the edges. So I'm going to be working on a smaller sample because you know there's not time for to make to make the whole thing. But I wanted to show you what what that looks like, what my little sample would be turning into if you're using the number of stitches in the pattern. Now a few things we need to look at when you look at the pattern itself. So if you have that pattern pulled up, you might wanna take a look at it because there's some important things that I wanna make sure you, you're paying attention to. The first is we're using Karen Lava Cakes and these are, um, I, I don't have the actual original one to look at, but they come in a variegated and solid together. So for instance, this one, I've, I've separated the solid from the variegated. So this was the inside, this was the outside of it. And I've rolled it into two separate cakes. So I've separated those two because I'm gonna be using the variegated for the top part and the solid for the bottom part. Same thing with this one. This was the elderberry ice. This was the inside, this was the outside. The colors that I have are elderberry ice and oh, let's see, mint cream. So it's not quite the same. I, I'm not using the icing color, I'm using the mint cream and you can see what that looks like. So you're going to separate those cakes into the variegated and the solid and just rewind them. The other thing you wanna make sure you do is pay attention to your gauge. Gauge is always important but it's especially important if you're making a garment to fit. So you're going to want to make sure that you are doing a gauge swatch. I, have, I did not do a gauge swatch, but you want to do a gauge swatch that's at least five inches square in half double crochet and measure the four inches in the middle. If you are not getting the gauge of 13 half double crochets and nine rows equals four inches or 10 centimeters, redo your gauge swatch until you're getting that. You may have to change your hook size to get that gauge because there's no point in doing all this crochet to make a garment if it's not going to fit when you finished, okay? It's worth taking the time. Now, now everybody hates me, right? Because I told you, you really, really need to do gauge, but I promise you that it's important and that that is the key to success is having that gauge uh, match the pattern gauge. Okay, enough of that, enough of me fussing at you about gauge before you've even done it. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Now I'm just gonna be doing this sample on, I'm gonna start with 16 chains instead of oh, whatever it says for your size, you'll pick your size. So let me just double check, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, all right. So I am beginning on page two of the pattern with the upper stripe pattern. So the first note says, this section is worked using the inner variegated section of each cake. 
So I am pulling out these two variegated parts that I have made. And I'm starting with the color A, and then I'm gonna do two rows of A and two rows of B. So I have to remember that, two rows of A and two rows of B. Okay, first row, I'm going to half double crochet in the third chain from the hook. The loop that's on my hook does not count as a stitch. So I'm going to count backwards, one, two, three. That white one right there is the third chain. Now to do a half double crochet, um, I'm gonna yarn over and then put it into the chain. I like to work into the back bump of the chain when I'm working into the foundation chain. To do that, I'm going to tilt it towards me. You see that bump on the back of the chain? There, there's the front of my chain and there are a bunch of bumps along the back. So I'm gonna sort of tilt it towards me, count back one, two, three, and work under that loop right there. So yarn over, go under that back bump, yarn over and pull up a loop, then yarn over and pull through all three to make my first half double crochet. I did a video on working in the back bump. So if you want to know more about that, you can look in the chat. And I think Renee is probably gonna put that link in there for you so you can check that out again. So now I have done my half double crochet in the third chain from the hook. And my pattern tells me to half double crochet in each of the next 13, 15, 17, so on. Since I'm working on a smaller piece, I'm not gonna work that many, but I'm gonna work in the back bump across, not all the way across, I'm working halfway across really. So I'm doing all these hat, whoops, I'm starting to do, I have to be careful. I get so much in the habit of doing double crochets. I have to get used to doing half doubles. Pay attention, there's a half double. Right now I'm crocheting, in my fun project, I'm crocheting a sweater in half double crochet. So I've been doing a lot of, um, sorry, in double crochet, I've been doing a lot of double crochet. All right. So I'm working up here. Got a couple more. So once I've worked that first section where it says half double crochet and next, however many. So the next thing it tells me is to chain two and half double crochet in each stitch to end. I want to check when I get to that point that I have the same number of stitches on each side. When I was doing my little swatch for this, I, which I'll show you in a minute, I found it a little bit tricky to make sure that I was counting correctly. So I'm gonna show you a little trick that I used to make it a little easier. Let me get to the end. This first row is the hardest. Okay, if I've done this right, I have the same number of half double crochets on each side. So here I'm going to stop one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Plus my turning chain. The note at the beginning of the pattern tells me that the turning chain does not count as a stitch. So right here on my pattern, it says chain two does not count as a stitch. I'm gonna to wanna to keep that in mind. This is not a stitch. So I'm happy right now with having the same number of stitches on each side. And what I found worked really well for me was to put a marker in the first stitch and the last stitch of the row so I can keep track of exactly 
where I am. That just helped me with my counting. So I'm going to do that here. Now, if I get interrupted, I know where the first and last stitches are. All right, so let's move on to the second row. If you're looking at the pattern, there is a typo here. It says first row, but it really means second row. So if you happen to see the pattern, it has two first rows. No, it doesn't. It, says, it should say second row. Maybe Renee's going to make a note of that. Chain two, that does not count as a stitch. So we're going to ignore it. Half double crochet in each stitch to chain two space. So I'm going to put my first half double crochet in that marked stitch right there. I'm not skipping it because the chain two doesn't count as a stitch. Now, as I say, I found it easier to put a marker here. So I'll find it that stitch when I come back. So half double crochet. I, now I don't have to think, I don't have to count. I'm just working up to the space. Here I am at the space and in the chain two space, I'm gonna put two half doubles, chain two, two half doubles all into that space, not into the chain, but into the space. Two more, it opens it up a little bit here, creates a hole. And then one half double crochet in each stitch to end of row. So you wanna make sure that you're working in each stitch to the end of the row. And I have my last stitch marked. So I will move that marker. And just to be sure, until I really get used to this stitch pattern, I'm going to stop and count again and make sure I have the same number of stitches on each side, not counting that chain two on either side. So let's pretend I counted. And now I'm going to get, I'm not going to use this color anymore. I'm going to switch to the other variegated color, the other variegated yarn. Now I can either carry the yarn up the side or cut the yarn, whichever I prefer. Here's something the pattern didn't tell me to do. It didn't actually tell me how to change color. So I want to talk you through changing color on the last stitch. Let me take out this last stitch. To change color to the next color on the last stitch of the row, I'm going to do my stitch, go in, yarn over, pull up a loop, and I'm going to stop right there because I want to do my last yarn over and pull through with the new color. So here I am with three loops on my hook for my half double crochet, but I wanna change color because I've done two, two rows of A, variegated A. Now I'm gonna do two rows of variegated B. And hold on, I grabbed the wrong yarn. I wanna get the variegated here. I'm just going to do a yarn over with the new color and pull through all three. I have left a nice long tail. That's about a six inch tail because I wanna be able to weave in that end very securely later. So now I have changed color and I'm going to turn and just repeat the row two basically of, um, of this with two rows of the variegated, of the variegated B. So again, half double crochet, in this stitch, move my marker. You don't have to use a marker. I just find it easier. I'm putting it in the stitch, the top of the stitch, not in the loop that's on the hook. Half double crochet. And you're gonna be gaining stitches every single row during this part 
of the pattern. So I'm working up to here. I'm going to put two half doubles, chain two, and two more half doubles in that spot. And then half double in each stitch to end. And that's the pattern row for the remainder of the bodice. So you'll just keep working um, two rows of A, two rows of B, all the way across until you've reached that full measurement of whatever your size is. So it starts to look like that. It starts to get very pointy. Now I'm gonna do the magic. You know that magic stuff they do in cooking shows where all of a sudden everything's ready and they switch to the next thing and you think, oh, wow, that would be really awesome if I could do that when I cook, but now I have to stop and chop the onions. But well, look, look at how fast I knit this other piece. So I mean, crocheted this other piece. So then you get this stripe effect. I'm not sure, does that show up on the camera? You can see the two yeah, uh, it's visible. Yeah, two variegated colors here. Okay. So and I see according to the pattern, you repeat only row two. Yeah, you're repeating row two of the pattern, but you're working two rows of the color. So let me make sure that's clear. The pattern is just one row, which is work to the center, increase at the center, and work to the end. But once you finish your bodice. So this is the part, this is a teeny little piece right here. There's the bodice that's where, you know, the, the shoulders are, would be right here. Now it's time to start working the body. I'm gonna bring this back in here. So here's the big version of it. And we're saying we've worked all the way to here. We're gonna do two things. We're gonna switch to striping with the solid yarn and we're going to switch to four rows each of the solid yarn. So this was variegated, right side row, wrong side row, change color, new color, right side row, wrong side row, change color. This is gonna be right side row, wrong side row, right side row, wrong side row, then change color. The stitch pattern is going to stay the same in the center, but it's going to change over here at the edge because we're not gonna be increasing anymore. This was, this was your original chain. You're gonna to wanna to start working straight here. So let me stop for a minute and grab a drink and see if there are any questions before I move on to that body portion. None just yet, but if anybody has any uh, questions, please weigh in in the chat and we'll make sure that Edie answers them. Yep. Please, and please do ask because this is a pretty fast one to explain and I'll have to just keep chatting. <laughs> I'll have to make it up. All right, so here I am. Let's say I finish the bodice and I'm ending that row because I know I need to change color. And now I need to check and see what color I'm changing to. It tells me to change to uh, four rows of A. So the solid color that went with this was the white. So I will grab the white color. And change color. So I'm going to leave that long tail and just do a yarn over and pull through everything. Now, the, depending on which size you're going to make, the pattern changes a little bit here. If you're making extra small, small, medium and large, you're going to follow these instructions. If you're making extra large, two to three X and four to five X, you're going to follow these instructions. And the main difference has to do with how the decreases are made. So I'm gonna show you both types of decreases. Let's just say we're working this extra small size here and we'll go with that instruction first. 
So remember, we're switching to four rows of the color, but we're changing the stitch pattern a little bit too. So chain two doesn't count as a stitch. So I'm gonna half double crochet in the first stitch and then half double crochet two together. So how do we half double crochet two together? That instruction is in the abbreviations. You do a yarn over and draw up a loop in each of the next two stitches. So there's my yarn over. I'm gonna go in and pull up a loop in this stitch and pull up a loop in this stitch. So I have four loops on my hook. Then I'm going to yarn over and draw through everything. All right. So that's my yarn over half, I mean, sorry, my half double crochet two together. Then one half double crochet in each stitch to chain two space. Well, that sounds familiar. Let's do that. It takes a while to get there, sorry. I see the question, do you have to separate color or can you just use a variegated yarn? You can certainly always just use a variegated yarn if you prefer. This is just taking advantage of the way these cakes are presented and, and really showing them to your advantage. But obviously you can always change yarn colors anytime you want. Here I am at this chain two space. So I'm going to do that thing I'm used to doing, which is two half doubles, chain two, two half doubles, and then one half double in each stitch to the last three stitches. So I'm gonna work till I have three stitches left. The good news is when you get to this row, none of the rows get any longer because you're decreasing at the edges up until now, every round, every row has gotten longer and longer. All right, so here I am and I have one, two, three stitches, one, two, three stitches left. It tells me to half double crochet two together. Oops, there's another little, there's another little typo right there that should say together, not T-O-H. So just notice that. So half double crochet two together. Here we go again, yarn over, go into the next stitch and draw up a loop, go into the next stitch, draw up a loop, and then yarn over and pull through all those loops together. Then half double crochet in the last stitch and turn. Then row two for this example is chain two, half double crochet in the first stitch, then half double crochet three together. So looking at the instructions again for the half double crochet three together, you're going to yarn over, go into the next stitch, pull up a loop, go into the next stitch, pull up a loop, and go into the next stitch and pull up a loop. That was one, two, three. I've got five loops on my hook, yarn over and pull through all five. And that is my half double crochet three together, which is what it calls for on the second row. Then half double crochet in each stitch, across to the corner, and we're basically gonna do the same thing on the other side, we're gonna also half double crochet three together. And for the small sizes, the smaller sizes, you have four rows of decreases. One has 
half double crochet two together and three of them have half double crochet three together according to this pattern. If you're looking at the larger sizes, you have half double crochet two together on the first one and half double crochet three together on the second one. And you're repeating just those two rows. In other words, there's a difference in the rate of decrease between those sizes. So you just have to follow the instructions for the size you are making. So I'm trying to zip along here to the end of this row, where we'll do another half double crochet three together. So here I am with, whoops, I think it's start, stop too soon. One, yeah, one, two, three, I've got one, two, three stitches left. I should have gone to the last four stitches. Here we go. Yarn over, go into the next one, pull up a loop, go into the next one, pull up a loop, and go into the next one and pull up a loop. Then yarn over and pull through all of the stitches and then half double crochet in the last stitch. And let's see if we can tell what's happening here. It's a little, a little too early to tell, but what's going to happen is it's going to start working straight here along the sides rather than increasing like this. So you're gonna do two more rows of the white and then I would switch to the solid color and, and do four, four rows of that. So it's the same either four stitch, four row repeat or two row repeat, depending on the size you're working on. All right, so once you've done that, you're gonna make a second one because hey, it's two, two pieces that are exactly the same and you'll have this long piece and it'll look like this at the end. Of course, you don't have to make it as long as it shows. If you wanna make it shorter than this, you can, to stop anytime because you're just working straight. Then you should block your pieces and sew the side seams. Now this sample that I have, they actually crocheted them together. I'm gonna show you what the seam looks like up close. So here they, they crocheted the seams together, which is certainly something you can do. They just did a single crochet. I think I would probably do a, a mattress stitch, which is a little more invisible um, than this, but either way is fine. Um, I, I just think, but you wanna make sure that when you sew it together, you're matching your stripes. You don't wanna get off at all. And that's another reason I like to do my seaming from the right side and I can see that my stripes are matching up. When you sew it, you're going to want to leave a slit at the bottom. So here it says leave a three inch slit. This looks like four inches to me, whatever, however you want. Because this is so long, if you don't leave a slit, you won't be able to walk. Have you ever seen those dresses that don't have like the really tight skirts and there's not enough of a slit and you know you can't bend your knees. So you definitely want to leave a slit down here at the bottom. Of course, you can make it longer if you want. So you're going to sew it all the way up here to the bodice and then you're going to do a row of single crochet and I'm just going to continue with this color since I have it. It says to work with, with variegated A, so let me do that. I'll switch, fasten off, come back to my variegated A over here. and work a round of single crochet evenly around this edge. So to do that, you'll just wanna be careful. I'm gonna start right here. Obviously you would have woven in your ends by now. You don't wanna work 
into a space like that. Can you see that I'm putting my hook into a space? That's just gonna create, let me show you what that's gonna do. If you're working into a space like that, it's just gonna make more of a hole than working between the stitches. Can you see what I've done there and it's creating more of a hole? I wanna work into the edge stitch itself. So I might have to take a little bit longer to work under the strands of the stitch rather than around a stitch. So you're gonna just try to work evenly. When you get to a top corner like this, the peak, if you will, you're gonna put three single crochets right here in the peak. So I'm gonna go one, two, trying to work into a stitch here, two, three. That gets you around that peak and going down the other side. The other reason that what I like here is, remember I worked into the back bump of the chain? When I work into the back bump of that foundation chain, Look at that lovely edge that it leaves for me. Rather than having one kind of loose loop that I would have gotten if I'd worked into the front of the chain, I get something that looks like a chain. And it makes it much easier to work under both loops of that V as I come down that front bodice. And it's a little tight. Maybe I should maybe I should have gone a little bit bigger on my hook when I did that first one, but I want to work under two loops here. Whenever you're doing an edging like this, especially when you're going along the selvage or the side edge that's kind of uneven, you want to stop and check to make sure that it looks good. If it starts curling, like ruffling, kind of like this, that means you have too many stitches. Or if it starts drawing in like this, that means you don't have enough stitches or drawing in like this. So you want it to just naturally lie flat. Another tip that I want to give you, I told you to put three single crochets here. That's what my pattern tells me to do. I probably am going to want to decrease right here at this valley, even though the pattern didn't tell me to, because let's see what's going to happen if I put a stitch in every chain here. Let's see if I'm happy with this. It may be fine. We'll see. This is what we call ad libbing because I don't really know what's gonna happen here. I'm gonna put a stitch in every stitch without doing a decrease. I'm gonna stop and take a look at it. Now that might be all right, but this looks like it's kind of popping up. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. There's, there's a little bit of a, it's like it's not wanting to lie flat there. There we go. Can you see what's happening here? That is sticking up a little bit. I can't see most people's faces, so I don't know if you can tell or not. But let me go back to that point. And what happens if right here, I do a single crochet two together? In other words, go into this stitch, go into the next stitch, and finish them off together and keep going. Let's see what that does. It seems like I should have to decrease right there. So whenever you're crocheting, don't be a slave to the pattern. Stop and take a look at what you're doing and see if you're super happy with it. And if you're not super happy with it, think about what you can do to maybe tweak it a little bit and make it look better. Okay, on my end, that looks way better. Remember how it was trying to pop up here? 
this is now lying completely flat. So doing a little decrease right here at this valley makes sense. In the same way that I did an increase at the peak to get around, if I had not increased here, this would have drawn in like this. So now I'm much happier at the bottom of this V with my decrease and I'll keep working on up here. And then the next stitch is going to be my three single crochets. Should have woven in the ends, it's kind of hard to see. And then I'm going to work down the edge here. Again, working into the stitches rather than into spaces around the stitches. And I'm going to do, I'm going to do a bad job here because I want to demonstrate what I was talking about. I'm going to do this poorly on purpose and see if I can. All right. Compare these two sides. Can you see what's happening here? Can you see it's pulling in, popping up? That's because I don't have enough stitches here. So it's curling in on me or might curl away. That's not what I want. So I'm gonna, because I'm looking at it and being critical of my own work, meaning not that I'm being mean to myself, but I'm just, reviewing it to make sure I'm happy with it. Let's see what happens if I put too many stitches along this edge. I thought, well, that wasn't enough. So I'm just gonna double up and do a whole bunch more stitches and see what happens. You can usually get a feel for this after a while and not have to do it over and over and over again. Right. Now, what's happening to that edge now? Can you see that it's not, it's also not straight? It's kind of bending. Compare it to this side. Can you see the one on the right is straight and this one's kind of bendy? Because there are too many stitches along here. So I'll pull it out again. And I'll go along and try to do the same number of stitches I had over here. The best way to do this, I think, is to figure out um, if I'm doing it like one single crochet in each row end along here, if that ends up on the first side, if that ends up being the right number for me, then that's what I'm going to do along this side. So I'm, I'm sort of saying, okay, I'm going to put one stitch in each row end or one stitch in every other row end or whatever it needs to be, then I can copy it and do the same thing over here, okay? And then finally, you're going to make a double tie. So you're going to hold the yarn, two, two yarns together to, let's see make your ties. This tells me to do it with color A, but I'm using color B just because I feel like it. And just hold the yarns together and do a chain for however long it says, 30, chain 30. And then you'll tie it off and attach it. Well, sorry, you're gonna slip stitch. I should, I should read the pattern, holding the yarns together. According to the pattern, you're going to slip stitch right here at the top of the peak and then do your chain 30. You'll do that at the top of all four peaks. So you'll end up with four ties to tie it on. Okay, I'm going to stop and get a drink and let you ask questions or let Renee tell me what questions there have been. Okay, so this is more of a sizing and dimensions question. So if somebody is a little bit wider in the hips than their upper body, 
Would we maybe add some increases? What would, how would you solve that? So I would, well, first I would practice on a little swatch like I'm doing here to make sure a proof of concept. But remember when we started doing those decreases um, at the sides to make it go straight, I would just not do as many decreases. You might wanna decrease some, but you could still keep increasing to the width you needed it to be and then start doing the decreases. So I think on the larger sizes, it's probably actually doing that. It, it's not, remember it's not decreasing as much each time. So you're just changing that angle of, instead of having it go straight down, you're having it kind of go like this, more like an A-line. But you'd have to do a little bit of math and um, experimentation to see what that would look like. But that's a great question because that's the first thing I thought when I saw this, I thought, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to wear that because it needs to be way wider at the bottom than it does at the top. <laughs> Do you have any tips for, you know, I guess the, speaking more generally, just altering patterns for sizes or, you know, is it experimentation? Are you sitting down with the math? How, like, what's your process? Okay, that's, yeah. So I was actually doing this last night, which is not a good time for me to do it because it's <laughs> math and it's night and I'm not maybe thinking very clearly. But the first thing I want to say is when people are afraid of garments, but they also expect a pattern to fit like right? Like, you know, I get a pattern, it should fit. I'm going to make the size I wear, it should fit. But we don't walk into stores expecting every item to fit. We expect that we might have to hem something or, you know, buy a larger size and take up the sleeves or, or the, the skirt or whatever. So it's the same thing in uh, crochet, you need to check the finished measurements. So on something like this, I'm going to look at that schematic that's on the pattern and compare it to not just my body measurements, but to um, a sweater that fits the way I want it to. So literally last night I was thinking, okay, I'm making this sweater. I want to check my measurements. I have measured myself, but then I went to my closet and got a sweater that fits the way I want the sweater I'm making to fit. And I measured that because that tells me something about the ease. The e ease is something we talk about that's the difference between your body measurement and the garment measurement. And the difference is what we call ease. So you might have something that has zero ease would be a really tightly fitting something or negative ease, or you might have something that has 10 inches of ease, which is very loose and you know loose fitting. So I was checking the ease. So I do sort of that comparison between what's in my wardrobe and what I'm making. And then I decide if I need to make adjustments to the pattern. And if so, where do I need to shorten the sleeves or you know choose choose a different size because most of the other size that I like I want it to fit at these points and this size will fit at those points, but I'm going to have to change the sleeves or the neck or something. Sorry, was that, I have sort of rambling. Did that answer your question, Renee? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I think it's all of the above, but that is a really, really good note about ease and particularly with grabbing things from your closet and sort of taking stock of that, something that fits really, really well and using that to inform things. Right. And, and the other thing I need to say about when you're grabbing something from your closet it not only has to fit the way you want it to fit, but it has to be a similar weight or fabric. So if you think about um, a, the way a, a, a t-shirt would fit, like a comfortable t-shirt versus the way a really heavy sweater might fit, the, the amount of ease you want for each of those, they may fit the same way, but the ease may be different because they're just different fabrics one is much thicker than the other so you also want to be comparing like apples and apples from your closet if that makes sense that makes perfect sense you don't want to be comparing like apples and potato chips exactly. to find the most unrelated things right, exactly <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. um so I had dropped a link um, for how to change colors into the chat for folks to see do you have any like tips or like secrets for how to get like not necessarily seamless but as seamless as possible in your color changes 
Yes. So the, the trick I showed about changing colors is important. Um, and the trick, the reason it works, let me switch back, let me switch cameras and show you why it works, because sometimes understanding that is actually more helpful. Um, and I'm just going to come back here with this and work along here. So here I am, and I'm gonna do a single crochet. Here I am, I'm coming along, I'm single crocheting. All right. I want you to watch what happens to this loop right here. I'm gonna to switch to the green. So I am not doing my fancy color change. I'm just changing colors. I finished my single crochet and now I'm gonna start with my new color with the green. Can you see the difference in color here, hopefully? Now watch what happens to this white loop right here. When I yarn over, do you see the loop, the white loop just jumped right over the green loop? I'm not sure how well that shows on this camera. But that's because the loop that's on your hook becomes the top of the next stitch. So when I'm back here and I'm doing a single crochet, I have to stop right here and then start with my new color because that loop, those loops are going to become the top. They're finishing off that stitch. And now I have a green loop. I can go in and that becomes the top of my next stitch. So that's why you need to finish off the last stitch with the new color. Otherwise you have that blip of color going over here. One mistake I see people make all the time is this. See that yarn tail? That one inch, two inch yarn tail? You are not going to be able to weave this in well enough for it to stay. It's gonna be really a pain to weave it in and it's not going to stay. You have to leave at least four or five, six inches to have enough to weave in. If you think you're saving yarn, because you're cutting it short, you're not saving it because your piece is going to, your ends are gonna come out. So you've done all that work and your piece is gonna fall apart. It, two inches here and there is not gonna make a difference in terms of how much yarn you're gonna buy. It's gonna make a huge difference in how much yarn and how well your piece is gonna hold up. Another thing while I'm on the topic of weaving in ends, it is also, not sufficient, you see that yarn tail? It is not enough to weave in your ends this way. You see how I'm catching the end there? Nope, that's not gonna hold either. I just caught the yarn tail behind the stitches. That's not enough. It's not going to be secure. It's not going to stay. You're just causing yourself grief on down the road. And if you're giving it, um, if you're giving it away and it falls apart, how happy are they going to be with you? But they're not ever going to tell you. So that's kind of like my main tip along here is make sure you're weaving in your end securely and you're leaving a long enough tail to weave in the end. I use, I do this some, but then I'll go back because I have a longer tail and I'll weave it in multiple directions so that I don't. Uh, I just don't want my ends to come undone. And it's just part of it. You know, just knowing that you have to weave in ends is, is just part of it. It's just part of the crochet. Watch a TV show and weave in your ends. And take a deep breath and know you're almost finished because you're weaving in your ends. <laughs> I like that you've made it a milestone of something to look forward to, something that a lot of us do not love. Exactly. We don't love weaving in our ends. You've made it like this lovely thing to look forward to. Well, I actually, once I sort of changed my mindset about it, it made it a lot better that I could just like, okay, here's what I'm doing now. It's a different thing, but it's part of the project. And it looks so pretty, like this whole mess of stuff right now. I mean, that's, that's a mess, right? That looks awful. But once I start weaving in my ends, 
it gets prettier and prettier because the ends go away. And then I get a little pile over on my table next to my sofa and I can see my progress. So just change your mindset, be very Zen about it. And if that doesn't work, don't come crying to me because I don't know what else to say. (laughs) I think that is wonderful advice. Do you have any other tips for kind of just occupational hazards? I don't know what else to call it. Like those little like annoying things that happen as a crocheter or just a yarn cross person in general. Right. So you've heard, poor, poor Renee has heard this before and maybe everybody else who's been here with me before. Gauge really does matter. It always matters. It always matters. If you don't know what I'm talking about, study up on gauge. Um, Actually, Renee, you can probably find I have how to measure gauge in single crochet if anybody wants to to see that video. Um, It always matters because it affects the fabric that you're making. So even if you're not making something that has to fit like the sweater we're doing today, it still matters what kind of stiffness the fabric has. So Like this is a pretty nice fabric here. It's something that would be comfortable to wear, but if your gauge was too tight, you would have a sweater that stands up on its own and that would not be comfortable. Or if your gauge is too loose, you're gonna have something that's so floppy that it doesn't have any, um, you know, any substance to it. And that might be fine for a shawl, but it's not okay for a garment you're going to wear or for a tote bag or something. So gauge always matters. Maybe the only time gauge doesn't matter is amigurumi, except it still matters there because it tells you how tight your fabric is. And with amigurumi, you wanna have really nice tight fabric so the stuffing doesn't show through. So I can't think of an example where gauge doesn't matter. Even if the pattern says it doesn't matter, it matters. And that's, I'm sorry, I give that lecture every time. I can't say it enough. You're preaching to the choir. I I like getting the speech every time. It's good. And also you're the boss of your own crochet, which I'm going to be printing and framing in my house. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Right. It's like, you need to know what's going on. And somebody asked me recently, like, why does gauge really matter if you're making it up yourself? Like if you're making up your own pattern, well, it's still, whether you're, whether you measure your gauge or not, there is gauge. Like, it exists whether you acknowledge it or not, right? So might as well acknowledge it and own it rather than be ignorant of it. And there's there's lots about how to measure gauge and how to like why it's important. And that's like its own. I teach a whole class on everything you want to know about gauge. So it's like I can go on for two hours about it, but we only have like five minutes left. So we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> It is really important and swatching is important. And these are, these are good crochet habits for all of us to carry. Mm -hmm. And I've actually talked to a few people recently who said, oh, this whole gauge thing was new to me, but because they were doing a program where they had to learn about it and I say like, I've been crocheting for 20 years and I never knew about gauge. And I'll say, well, why, why didn't you like, what was the hurdle? What was keeping you from, from, learning about it or knowing about it. And it's kind of interesting to hear what people say because they'll say, well, I wasn't making garments or they'll say, I didn't make garments because I didn't understand gauge and I made something and it didn't fit. Or they'll say, all my patterns say gauge doesn't matter. So I figured gauge doesn't matter. So it's really interesting kind of everybody's coming from it, coming to it from a different place. Um, and that's why I just reiterate it over and over and over again, because it matters. Even if you're going to ignore it, it's there. So, and I see some other questions. Let's see. Oh, is that Renee writing? Sorry. Mm-hmm. It's, I was directing oh. people to your wonderful video. Yeah. Um, yeah. I realized these colors weren't great. This is what they provided me. And that's the yarn I had to use. So yeah, we'll, it happens. We'll, we'll make sure to get some that are a little more contrasty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll think about that next, but it looks really pretty in person. You can see it in person. <laughs> when, yeah. When you go buy it. Yeah. It's really yeah. nice. Like pastels reminds me of cotton candy a little bit. Yeah. And it's really summery and, you know, appropriate. So I can, I think you can see it better here. These colors. Yeah. But they oh, all, yeah, we can see it really well. Yeah. Kind of the same values here. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to do something with this yarn. I'm not going to make this thing, but now I have all this lovely yarn. I'm going to have to make something with it. Yeah, that green especially. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Oh, show the item again. Do we want to show swatches yeah. or the yarn? You want to see the whole thing? Let me. Um, oh, excellent. If I, can. I can't oh, stand that. There we go. Yeah, we can see all of it. Janice, this is the whole project. Yeah. So it's got this skirt with the slit in the side, a little bit of a slit, and then the bias and it ties at the top. And you can see the picture, it looks much better on, I think, and you can see it on the, the model in the pattern. Um, yeah, so. I think this is a great like beach cover up. Yeah, you're definitely going to want to wear something under it because it's got that hole in the, well, I don't know, maybe not, but <laughs> um, it's got that hole in the middle where the increases were. So um, that's another reason half double crochet is good for this. If it were double crochet, it would be a lot holier throughout. So the half double crochet is a good solid stitch here, but it does have that kind of hole in the down the front. So you're definitely going to want to wear it as a beach cover up or with a, you know, cami and slip or something under it. Or sure. not, whatever. <laughs> so you're the boss of your own crochet. Yeah, exactly. I, I... You can wear anything you want. Um, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining me. And I hope if you do make this, you will, uh, Renee will tell us all the tags, but be sure to tag me too. I'm on social media at Edie Ekman pretty much everywhere. I would love for you to join me in my newsletter, which is edieekman.com slash newsletter. And um, I'll see you again at another Michael's Community Classroom. Did I get that right, Renee? Your yeah, turn. you got it. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, as Edie said, thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to share your work with hashtag make it with Michaels and hashtag yarnspo. That's Y-A-R-N-S-P-O and Edie Ekman everywhere. I call it E to the power of three. That's where you can find Edie. Um, make sure you tag Edie. Make sure you tag us. We love to see what you're working on and to see you know, like the fruit of your labors. Um, so we're really excited to see all of those. And just a reminder that you can find more classes on michaels.com and a recording of today's class at michaels.com slash classes. Okay. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank